Good morning, Christ Fellowship Church. Happy Easter. He is risen. Amen. Would you please open up with me to Hebrews chapter 13? Hebrews chapter 13. If you don't have your Bible, the uh, verses and the words will be on the screen, or you can open up your Christ Fellowship app and uh, get a link to it there. We're just going to cover two short verses this morning as we consider the blessing of Easter Sunday. I'll read it for us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good so that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. I love to read history. I also love to read biographies. So every year I I pick a different biography of some person that has passed that had significance to our society and try to learn about this person. So this year I'm reading about Napoleon Bonaparte. In the past I've read about Caesar or Teddy Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln. And I really enjoy reading these biographies to figure out what makes this person tick, this person that really influenced history, this person that really changed things for our world, what made them the way that they are. But the net result of the change in my life at the end of every biography is exactly the same. I finish the book, I put it down, I say, that was really interesting And then I move on with my life as though I had never read the book. The biographies of some of the most famous people in the world, though very interesting, uh, though intriguing, do nothing to change my life. My life's exactly the same after I read them as before. And I just wonder if maybe that's you with Easter this morning. Uh, Maybe you're here and you're like, Yeah, I like the songs, I know the story, I've heard it since I was a kid. Maybe you even believe the truth of Easter. But maybe it really just hasn't made any practical difference in your life. Maybe you're wondering this morning, what's the difference between what Teddy Roosevelt did at some point in time in his life and this story about Jesus rising from the dead? And the answer is everything. Easter changes everything. This morning in this short, these two short verses, we're going to see why Easter, why the story, the historicity, the true story of Jesus rising from the dead is different than the true story of different biographies of people that you might read. We're going to see that Easter is the greatest blessing. And if you really understand it, if it really drives down into your heart, it will change your entire life. So we're going to see two things in this text. In verse 20, we're going to see the God of blessing. And in verse 21, we're going to see the blessing of God. So look with me at verse 20 as we look at the God of blessing. And I want to ask three questions. Who is this God? What did he do? And how did he do it? So the God of blessing, first, who is this God? In verse 20, notice he is described as the God of peace. If you don't know anything about Christianity, if you're new to church, if you're not acquainted with the Bible, first of all, we want to say that we're really glad that you're here. We're really glad that you've chosen to join us this Easter Sunday. And if you're not familiar with the Christian God, here's what we'd like to say about him. He is the God of peace. More on that in a moment, but we never want to let one verse be taken out of context. And so all of Hebrews talks a lot about God. In fact, the author of Hebrews, this letter that he's writing to these Christians, he talks about God almost 70 times by name in his letter. And he says a lot of things about him to describe him. He's a speaking God, chapter 1, verse 1. He deserves worship. His throne is forever. He loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. He has borne witness to his salvation. 
He's the builder of all things, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4 says. He is the God of the living. Chapter 3, verse 12, chapter 9, verse 14, chapter 10, verse 31, chapter 12, verse 22. His word is living and active. He keeps his promises. He etches his law into the hearts of his people. He is fearful. He created the universe by his word. He rewards faith. He has built an eternal city. This God disciplines his children. He is the judge of all. He is a consuming fire, and he can be pleased. All of those things are said about this God in the letter to the Hebrews. But as the author finishes up the letter, as he gives this benediction, as he describes how Easter is a blessing, something he wants you to know about this God is that this God that is also a consuming fire, this God that is also the judge of all, this God that spoke everything into being, he's a God of peace. Which this year is just a balm to our soul, is it not? I mean, if you could use one word to describe the events of the last year, my guess is peaceful may be the last word you would reach in the English language. We've been through a pandemic together. Easter Sunday last year, we recorded Easter worship on Thursday because we couldn't meet together. Some of you have lost your jobs due to the pandemic and the government shutdowns. Some of you have lost loved ones in the midst of this pandemic to COVID-19. Many have experienced depression and anxiety as the result of isolation. I mean, we've been through a lot in the last year. We've seen cries for racial justice. We've seen protests. We've seen riots. We've seen a divisive presidential election. We've seen divisive aftermath to the presidential election. We've been through a lot of strife, a lot of unrest, both in our country and probably as individuals. Each one could probably stand up here and talk about different ways in your life you've experienced strife and anxiety and worry and hurt and depression and fear over the last year. But the good news of Easter, the blessing of God, is that He is a God of peace. And what the Scriptures tell us is that our lack of peace in life is not because of a pandemic. It's not because of an election. It's not because of these different societal factors. Ultimately, our root cause for our lack of peace is that you and I as humans are at war with God. The the main problem that we have is not all that we've endured this last year. Our main problem is our relationship with God is broken. We've declared war on Him. We don't want Him to be our authority. We want to be our own authority. And this war, this strife with God has broken everything else. And we've experienced the especially painful ramifications of that in the last year. But the good news of Easter, the blessing of God is who is this God? This God is a God of peace. Easter has changed everything. Easter has given a way for peace to break in into the midst of our strife. So who is this God? He's the God of peace. But what did he do? Look again at verse 20. He brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Here's the good news. This God of peace didn't just send you good vibes. This God of peace didn't just give you positive thinking. Uh, This God of peace didn't just say, sorry, your life's been terrible this year. I hope things get better. This God of peace invaded history and actually did something. He raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Not as a metaphor. Easter is not about how winter always turns to spring. Easter is not about how, you know, we all fall down sometimes and we can just get up. Easter is not a metaphor. Easter is a historical reality that the body of the Lord Jesus was in the tomb, buried dead, and God raised him up from the dead to eternal, everlasting, glorious resurrection life. If Easter is a metaphor, Easter is worthless. Because I don't know about you, but I need more than a metaphor that winter turns to spring. 
I need the invasion of new life into my broken, dead, hurting life. And that's what Easter is. God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Easter is also not a myth. You know, it's easy to think on Easter, and maybe this is you. You know, it's a nice story. Makes me feel happy. But we all know it's just a myth, right? These, these kind of desperate disciples of Jesus, they made up this story to make themselves feel better. Maybe followers of Jesus, you know, a couple hundred years later, kind of made up this story to, to make it all fit together nicely. But there's several good reasons to believe that Easter is not a myth. I want to just quickly give you three as we talk about Jesus being raised from the dead. Number one, the, the truth of Easter, the, the stories of the Gospels which tell about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus were written too early to be myths. The stories of Jesus were written in the same generation as those who were eyewitnesses to the account of the resurrection. Uh, We have letters about the New Testament church coming out just years after Jesus rose from the dead. And these letters reference people that were eyewitnesses over 500 to the risen Jesus. Myths take generations and generations and generations to form. Eyewitness accounts that could contradict what was being written in the Gospels about Jesus can't happen that way. The Gospels were written too early to be myths. Secondly, they're too countercultural to be myths. When we look at all the stories, Christina read it in Matthew chapter 28 earlier, women were the first to see the risen Jesus. In all the Gospel accounts, women are the first people to see the risen Jesus, and women are the first people to tell this Easter story to the dudes scared hiding underneath their tables. And that that in our culture, we're like, yeah, women power. We like that, right? But not in the first century. In the first century, a woman's testimony wasn't even valid in court. So if you were trying to make up the story of Easter, if you were creating a myth to make it seem more believable, you would not have created women always being the first people to see the risen Jesus. It actually would have hurt your credibility. The gospel accounts were written too early to be myths. They're too countercultural to be myths. We see women at the tomb. We we also see there's no concept of one person rising from the dead in Jewish culture. All the Jewish people thought people would all everyone would rise from the dead at the end of time. The concept that one person would rise from the dead in the middle of time was unheard of in Jewish thought, and it was unheard of in pagan thought. There's no there's no concept of the resurrection. Totally countercultural. Too early, too countercultural, and finally, too unhelpful. If you're creating a myth where you would give power to the leaders of the early church, you would want to make sure those leaders look good. And the disciples do not look good in the gospel accounts. Peter, right the night before, he says, Jesus, I'll never betray you, I'll go to the death with you. He says, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter tries to chop, he, Peter chops a guy's ear off. Then he denies Jesus three times. One of the people pressuring him was like this teenage girl in a courtyard. Peter's the leader of the early church. You think if a myth was created, you'd make your hero a little more mythical, a little more manly. But all the disciples abandon Jesus. They run away. They look like fools throughout the gospel accounts. They constantly don't understand what Jesus is talking about. They're two steps behind him. They're never on track with him. They don't look very intelligent. If you were creating a myth, you'd want to make sure the leaders of your early movement look like they had their life together, and they look like anything but that. There's every reason to believe that Easter really happened The accounts were too early, the accounts were too countercultural, and the accounts were too unhelpful. What God did on Easter Sunday is he literally raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Not a metaphor, not a myth, but an alive body after a dead one. But you know something so encouraging, something so helpful, is that he calls him the great shepherd of the sheep. Do you notice that? who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus is accurate. I mean, the person who rises from the dead as the victorious Son of God is the Lord. The the message of Easter Sunday is that Jesus is King, and you should bow before Him. You should worship Him. You should give Him your life. 
But he's not just described as the Lord. He's not just described as king. He's described as the great shepherd. You know, and it's so interesting. We don't live in an agrarian society. I mean, this is metro Atlanta after all. I don't know if any of you have sheep in your backyard. If you do, I would please, I would like to meet you after the service. I'd just have some questions. But even though we live in an urban society, right, even though we're in a metro area, there's something about a shepherd that's comforting to us. I mean, even in our day and our time, something about a shepherd makes us feel comfort. I mean, whether or not you're a a Christian, you are probably familiar with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's such comfort in that psalm. There's a reason that psalm is so often read at funerals. In in the midst of our grief, we want a shepherd who's going to care for us. And here's the amazing news of Easter. Here's why Easter is the greatest blessing. Because God raised up the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, the resurrection means you always have a shepherd. You always have someone you can lean on. You always have someone you can go to in times of strife, in times of hurt, in times of loss in your life. There's always a constant shepherd For those of you who have lost loved ones in life, you know, maybe you've lost a a, a mom or dad that was always your first call when life would go bad. The the person that you leaned on for help. Do you remember that first time something was going wrong and you wanted to pick up the phone or you wanted to text them and you realized you couldn't? The feeling of helplessness that this this is the person that I I look to for, for help when life is bad. The resurrection means that we never have to deal with that. Our shepherd isn't dead. Our shepherd isn't going anywhere. Our shepherd is alive forevermore. This shepherd is yours forever because of Easter. He's not just the Lord. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. He cares for your soul. He cares for your body. And he wants you to come to him when you have need in life. He offers us to come and to unload our burdens on him. That is this great shepherd of the sheep. Who is this God? He's the God of peace. What did he do on Easter Sunday? He raised Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, from the dead. How did he do it? Notice the last phrase. By the blood of the eternal covenant. Now, if you're new to church this morning, that probably sounds kind of weird, right? Blood and covenant seem so strange. But throughout the letter of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews has been comparing the old covenant to the new covenant. And he uses the word eternal covenant here in chapter 13, verse 20, to mean the same thing as new covenant. And a covenant was something in the Bible uh, that was a little more intense than what we would have as a contract today. A covenant was a legally binding contract. It was a bond in blood sovereignly administered. It was a bond between two parties, an agreement. It was sealed in blood. Actually, in these days of the Near East, you would chop up some animals, you'd place them on two sides, you'd walk in between the animals, and you'd shake on your agreement as if to say, if I break my end of the deal, may what happened to these animals happen to me. You, we complain about getting things notarized. <laughs> a bond in blood, and it was sovereignly administered. It wasn't between two equals. A greater would make a covenant with a lesser. And so throughout Hebrews, he's been talking about the old covenant, Moses and the Ten Commandments and, and what God did through that. 
And he's describing how this new covenant brought on through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus is better than the old. How it's made the old covenant obsolete. And he points out that we always knew that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. You see, the old covenant was built on this sacrificial system where when you sinned, you had to offer sacrifices. Intentional sins, unintentional sins, yearly sacrifices, right? There are all these sacrifices that you had to make atonement for your sin. Because what the covenant was displaying is that you stand guilty before God. You have blood on your hands, so to speak, and you need blood forgiveness. That you have violated this God's commandments, you violated his law, and you are not right with him. You stand guilty. But the difficulty with this covenant is you had to offer these bulls and these goats and these lambs again and again and again and again. It was never enough. And Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, comes in and says that this new covenant that Jesus has provided, this one time for all sacrifice, lasts forever. It's everlasting. And so how did God raised the great shepherd of the sheep. Well, he raised him by the blood of the eternal covenant. We don't sacrifice bulls and goats here, right? Even if you're uh, not a Christian, right, you, you're, you're not out sacrificing different animals. But there's something that we can press into and how to apply this into our lives today as well. If the old covenant wasn't enough to make you right with God, the old covenant that was prescribed by God, he said, do this. This is the kind of sacrifices I want you to offer. If that wasn't enough, surely our good deeds are not enough to make us right with God. If the old covenant that God had given wasn't enough to be everlasting, surely our deeds aren't. And here's the reality this Easter morning is you can spend your whole life trying to be good enough. You, you, you can spend your whole life trying to do these deeds, perform in such a way to please God, and it will never be enough. There's a part in Shakespeare's Macbeth where Lady Macbeth has helped her husband murder some people. And she keeps seeing blood on her hand. And she says, this spot, this spot, I can't get it out. Who knew the old man bled so much? And no matter how much she cleans it, no matter how much she does, she can't remove the blood stain from her hand. It's an amazing picture of the human race. We are stained. We stand guilty before a holy righteous, perfect, pure God. And the thing we deserve for that is this God's judgment. We deserve his wrath. And so throughout life, so many of us try our best to convince ourselves that we're good, but in reality, we're just like Lady Macbeth. We're trying to rub out a spot that will never get rubbed out. Enter the new covenant. Enter the blood of the eternal covenant, which has a way to wipe away all your sin, all your stain, all your shame, all the judgment that you deserved. There's a great line in the chapter before this, in Hebrews chapter 12. It says that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you remember Abel? In Genesis, Abel was the first person murdered in the history of the world. And so his blood cries out from the ground. What does it cry? Justice. Condemn my brother. My brother killed me. Give me justice. And the author of Hebrews says that the blood of Jesus cries out a better word, and it cries out, forgive. Justice has been done at the cross. It was finished upon that cross. Justice is done. Give forgiveness. Grant pardon. Grant relief. Grant peace. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word, and it speaks a better word forever. It's the blood of the eternal covenant.
planned in eternity past, ratified on Good Friday, and proven on Easter. You know, Easter Sunday is proof that the blood worked. Easter Sunday is proof that the blood of the eternal covenant really is eternal. That the sacrifice that Jesus offered to absorb the wrath of God for our sin, to stand in the place of judgment for us, worked. That Good Friday is effective because Easter proved that Jesus rose up from the grave. God the Father ratified the covenant by raising Jesus up. This is the God of blessing in Easter. The God of peace who raised Jesus the Lord, the great shepherd of the sheep from the dead, by the blood of the eternal covenant. That's the God of blessing that we worship this morning. Easter is the greatest blessing. And to understand that blessing, you've got to understand the God that it comes from first. But then in verse 21, he turns to the blessing of God. The blessing of God, let's look at that just for a minute. Essentially, here's the blessing of God. Here's the blessing that God offers to you this morning if you will turn to Jesus. Inward transformation leading to everlasting worship. That's the blessing of God. Not a new house, not a new car, not an easy life. Inward transformation leading to everlasting worship. So first, it's inward transformation, the blessing of God. Notice So in verse 20, he's described this God. And then in verse 21, it's what he's asking this God to do. He asks that he would equip you with everything good. Why? That you may do his will. He's asking that this God would equip you with everything good for the purpose of doing his will. And then he adds that God is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Now, you might be wondering, what is everything good? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, the author talks about Jesus being the high priest of the good things that have or will come through the new covenant. In chapter 10, verse 1, the author of Hebrews talks about the law being a shadow of the good things to come. And what we see is that good things in Hebrews probably refers to the law of God being written on our hearts. So it's a shadow of the good things to come. The law is Jesus uh, was a high priest of the good things that will come. What's the good things? Jeremiah 31, 33, God will write his law on our heart so that the commands of God are not something above you bearing down on you, saying you must, you must, you must. The commands of God are written inside of your heart, so you say, I want, I want, I want. I want to obey God. I want to follow Him. I want to live for Him and glorify Him forever. His commands are not a burden, they're a delight. That is the blessing of Easter. That's the change of Easter. It's an inward transformation. So he's praying that this God would equip you with everything good, the covenant, the new covenant being written on your heart so that you can do his will, so that you can follow him, so that you can obey him, so that you can honor him. All that he's also working in you to do that which is pleasing in his sight, that you can live a life that pleases God through the power of the new covenant. John Newton, the great hymn writer, wrote this. Our pleasure and our duty... Though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice transforms a slave into a child and duty into choice. The blessing of Easter is that the God who made you, the God that you were designed for, the God that you were designed to live for, to enjoy him forever, has made a way to place his law inside your heart to transform you from the inside out so that you delight to do what he requires. And since he created you, what he requires is for your good. It's for your betterment. Duty turns into delight. Jesus, when he was asked about how to summarize the law of God, 
He said that you could summarize it by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love, loving God and loving neighbor is the essence of the law. And so what Easter does, the blessing of God at Easter, is it invades our hearts supernaturally to enable us to gladly love God and love others. In 2006, a, a gunman came into an Amish schoolhouse. He shot 10 young children. He killed five, and then he took his own life. Within hours of this mass tragedy in the Amish community, members of the Amish community showed up at the home of the shooter to comfort his family for their loss. Then three days later, to the shock of the nation, over half of those in attendance at the gunman's funeral were members of the Amish community mourning with the family who had lost a loved one as well. And if you remember that, do you remember thinking, what can produce that kind of love? What can produce that kind of forgiveness? What, what can produce that kind of kindness? Easter. That's what Easter produces. Easter changes us to be people who love God and love people out of delight. It enables us to do that which would be impossible to do on our own. The blessing of God is inward transformation that finally leads to everlasting worship. Notice how he ends the benediction. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We don't know if he's talking about Jesus or he's talking about God the Father from the beginning. Most commentators think he's kind of circling back to God the Father, but either way, they both get glory forever and ever. He ends with doxology. He ends with worship. This inward transformation, it leads to everlasting worship. We're transformed slowly, imperfectly on earth here to become more loving, more patient, more kind, more generous people, but one day it will be complete and we will experience everlasting worship before the throne of the Lamb as we declare salvation belongs to the Lamb, as we declare worthy are you, worthy are you, O Lord. This everlasting worship is what Easter has purchased for us. So this blessing the blessing of Easter starts with God, and it ends with God. It starts with a God of peace, and then it ends with a God who deserves everlasting white-hot worship of his people for all time, forever and ever. You see, the point of Easter isn't just that God could forgive us so that we could go to heaven. And that's how we talk about the gospel a lot. You're a sinner. Jesus died to save you. So when you die, you can go to heaven. The point of Easter is that Jesus came so you could get God. Forgiveness is the means to get you to God himself, to get you into his presence, to delight in his glory, to enjoy everlasting worship of the one you were made to worship with your whole heart. C.S. Lewis once famously said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. My friends... We're all looking for blessing, but we are like children trying to find that blessing in mud pies. We look for the things of this world, relationships, status, money, things, to be the blessing that we're looking for. I just want to tell you that God says you're far too easily pleased, that the scripture says that the blessing of God is greater than everything the world has to offer. Inward transformation 
leading to everlasting worship so you could know, love, and enjoy the God who created you forever. This Easter, the blessing of God offered to you is nothing less than God himself. Come and enjoy him forever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you raised the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, from the dead. That it's not a myth, it's not a metaphor, it's true life. But unlike so many events in history, it actually changes us when we really look to you. Father, I pray this morning for those who come in here with doubts. We thank you that they're here. We want to be a place for them to ask questions. I pray for those who are wondering if this really happened, you know, if this is really real. Lord, would you speak to their hearts today? For those who are wondering, does it really even matter? God, would you speak to their hearts today? We thank you for the high and holy privilege of getting God, of enjoying you forever. Thank you. That's what Easter means We pray that we'd look to you and enjoy you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.